Okay, the record is on, and I just want to show you a cartoon that one of my students sent me from my other class. He, he had taken like three classes from me already, so you know, he, he knows what kind of stuff you know, that I teach in my classes. And uh, this is a cartoon that he you know, showed me, <laughs> and you can see. <laughs> and it will pop up too because of today's discussion. Um, so the professor is saying, you know, thus, for any non-deterministic Turing machine M that runs in some polynomial time, we can devise an algorithm that takes an input W of length N and produce, you know, E M W E N W. The running time is big O, and we'll talk about the big O notation today. Uh, P squared, you know, N on a multi multi tape deterministic Turing machine, and blah blah blah. And I actually still vaguely remember that stuff too. Um, um, when you move on to a four year university in a computer science program, that stuff will be introduced in what usually they call that computation theory type of class. Okay, you know, there are multiple names. You know, some people just call that you know state machines and stuff like that. Um, and the interesting part is, in terms of hardware, you know, since the end of World War II, we have seen a lot of progress. Okay, you know, compared to all the other technologies that came out from World War II, I would say computer technology or electronics in general has seen you know the most progress or the most advances. I mean, jet engines. Yeah, we have you know better jet engines than at the end of World War II, but not really by that much. Okay. Um, Explosives, yep, okay. Uh, nuclear bombs, yep, you know, much bigger. But in terms of computer theory, I mean, you know, we have, not computer theory, but the hardware of computers, we have seen, you know, just an insane amount of advances, you know, since the end of World War II. Um, but the, the funny part is the computational theory, which is the theoretical part of, of computer science, has not changed at all since the end of World War II. Okay. The next time there will be any change is going to be um, quantum computers being, you know, being the, the mainstream computer. That will warrant a big change or big shift of what we, you know, what we used to theorize uh, computation theory. So anyway, you know, this is funny because you know, one of the students just said, you know, man, I just wanted to learn how to program video games, thinking you know, <laughs> none of this actually matters, right? <coughs> um, it, so it depends on you know what this person means. You know, program video games. I mean, you know, video games can be very technical. I mean, it's one of those things where um, it's highly competitive. Okay, because how many gaming engines are there? I mean, how many gaming companies are out there competing with each other? Quite a few. Okay, but the competition is you know is ferocious, right? I mean, these companies all want to outdo the other company. Um, and knowing how to uh, you know look at you know programming in a certain view in a certain way is actually quite important even when it comes to you know just gaming. Um, so anyway, I just want to show you guys this one. It's just kind of funny, and I have the feeling that some people might have that feeling, like that student with the thought bubbles, um, somewhere in the middle or maybe the early part of today's lecture. All right, <laughs> fantastic. <laughs> All right, so what we'll do today is we're going to take a look at uh, topic six, and this is about basic algorithms involving arrays, such as searching in an unsorted and sorted array. So we are now moving on to you know, searching in a sorted array, and, and I, I changed the uh, Moodle interface a little bit here, so it, you know, you, I have to click it to actually get into the topic itself, so it's not as distracting. You know, I don't have to scroll up and down all the time to find anything. And by the way, I also changed the gray book. If you look at the gray book right now, it will give you a much more realistic um, in semester interim grade that reflects you know, both only the work that I have graded. So that will be the midterm exam and also your homework assignment. Okay? Um, you know, there are, I got quite a few people getting A's you know, at this point, you know, with 100% out of 100%. Your own grade entry also gives you a ranking, you know, of everything. So it will give you a ranking, you know, from one to the number of people in class. One out of, you know, many, the number of people in class, bar, class, bar, okay? Um, nobody's getting it. You guys, <laughs> come on, steady. <clears throat> okay, so one means good, okay? Because one means you rank first of the entire class. 
Okay, so that number kind of gives you an idea of where you are in the class, but not only as an overall grade, but also for each individual question in the exam, each individual homework assignment, um, the exam as a category, the homework as a category, and so on. So that gives you a pretty good picture of you know, where you stand in class um, in terms of grades. Now, I do not grade this class in, you know, with a curve. In other words, you know, the, uh, the breakpoints of A, B, C, D, F, they are basically absolute. Um, you know, if the entire class do really well, the whole class can get A's in this class. If the whole class you know, is not doing so well, the whole class can get B's or below. Uh, but typically, I don't get you know, really lopsided grades you know, in this class. So and at this point, I do not have any indication that you know, there will be any problem of you know, lopsided you know, either on either side of this class. So right now, the class is pretty evenly you know, distributed like a bell curve. So that's good. Are there any questions at this point about your grades? Because I know quite a few people have expressed concerns and asked, you know, I got everything. How come I'm still getting a D out of this class? That's because I'm still including the final exam and the second exam, you know, which we have not, you know, taken yet in your grade, and also the homework assignments that we have not assigned yet. So <coughs> at this point, it is accurate. Okay, it is just based on everything that I have graded in this class. Have you done that since Thursday? Huh? Have you done that since Thursday? No, nope, I've done it only today and okay. yesterday. So if you haven't checked yet, you know, you might want to check it now because you might find it is quite a bit different from last week. Okay. All right. So we talked about uh, short-circuited Boolean operators already, and you can actually see that there will be a homework assignment called binary search. So we'll see how far we can go today and then, you know, whether I will actually uh, unleash that homework assignment. But at this point, you know, we are going to talk about searching in a sorted array. Now, searching in a sorted array is kind of nice because uh, you can speed up the, the search operation um, a little bit if you're doing linear search, but you can also do binary search, which is a whole lot better than you know, a linear search. Okay, so what I'll do is I'm going to reintroduce linear search, which we have talked about in this class, and I'll just kind of throw in one little optimization that makes you know, searching in an array a lot faster. So we'll just say that k is the value to look for in an array A. Okay, so that's basically given to us. You are given an array with initialized values in the elements, and also a particular value k that you're looking for. The basic algorithm looks like this: I get zero, and we say while uh, this is using, this is incorporating short-circuited uh, Boolean expression evaluation. So we have to check for the boundary first and say that while i is less than bar a bar, which means as long as i can be used as a valid index, then we check whether it is the same as the element that we're looking at. Then we say, and a bracket i does not equal to k, because if it does equal to k, we can get out of the loop already. And all we're going to do in the loop is to say <coughs> i plus i plus 1, so we move on to the next element. When the loop does exit, how do I know whether the element that I'm looking for is found or not using the code as it is right now? In other words, if I have to print a message, you know, whether you know, I actually found um, the value k or not in the array, how would, I, how would I do this? I'm just going to leave the parentheses empty for now, and then I say you know, print found, else print not found. Okay, in other words, I'm just printing to the screen you know, whether the element is actually found or not. What should I put here inside the parentheses as an indicator that, yep, I just you know, found the value, or at least one value, one element in the array that is matching the value that I'm looking for? What should I put here? Um, okay, well, that's not a bad start, but it does have its problems, okay? So if you put something like this, what if I exit the loop only because i is greater than or equal to bar a bar? Then I have a problem, right? So I don't want to do any type of indexing because you know it is possible that i is out of bound at this point. So what do, what should I do if I don't use indexing? And hmm? i is less than bar a bar. I is less than bar a bar. Yeah. Well, that's it. You can no no you can. 
what he said and that. Can you do that? Say again? What he said and that. Um, you only need one. Oh. This is already sufficient. Because if I is still less than bar A bar at this point, how did I get out of the loop? Now, if I is less than bar A bar at this point, I could not have gotten out of the loop because of the left-hand side of the conjunction, right? Because the left-hand side of the conjunction is still true at this point. So the fact that I'm out of the loop means the right-hand side of the conjunction has to be false. But what does it mean when A bracket I does not equal to K is false? It means they are the same, right? So I just found it. So that's why you know, we, have, we can use this as an indicator that yes, we found the, the, the value that we're looking for, or at least there's at least one element in the array with the same value. Okay, so this is the original algorithm. No biggie here. If I tell you the array is already sorted, we can do something a little bit smarter, but really not by much. Okay, because if, okay, I'll give you an example first. Example always help. Okay, so this time we're dealing with an array that is already sorted. So we'll have, you know, let's say the value 3, 6, 10, 15, 16, and that's my array. Okay, I have an array of five elements, and I'm looking for, look for the value, let's say, 7 in the following array. Okay, so I use a linear search mechanism. I compare 3 to 7. Nah, it does not equal to 7. Move on to the next one. 6 compared to 7 does not equal. Then I move on to 10. And I say 7 does not equal to 10 either. Should I go any further? No. In a linear search? It would. I would not need to go any further in a linear search because the, the array is sorted. So 7 being, I mean 10 being greater than 7 means all of the remaining elements would also be greater than seven, which means they cannot equal to seven. So I can utilize that one little fact and make the algorithm slightly more efficient. Is that making any sense? Okay, so I'll go ahead and make the modification in my algorithm. Whenever I make my algorithm more efficient, I'm trying to make it so that the, um, the while condition will become false <laughs> earlier, okay? There are two ways to make it, make, to make it uh, become false a little bit earlier, or possibly earlier. One is to add a conjunction and, you know, so that I have another chance to make it false. The other way to do it is to do something like this. Okay, I remove, because not equal to is the same as less than or greater than. So if I remove the disjunction, that means, oh, now it will become false more frequently, or there's a higher chance that it becomes false. Because I'm only staying in the loop as long as A bracket I is less than K, assuming the array is sorted in a non-decreasing fashion, okay? Does that make any sense? This will just optimize it a little bit. But then I also have to change my condition down here, because just because I is less than bar A bar when the loop exits, doesn't mean the element is found anymore because I can't shortcut the whole thing and just say, hey, you know, I compare it to the element where it is greater than the value that I'm looking for, so all the rest, you know, I can skip. But because of that reason, I can, this alone is no longer sufficient to say that I have just found it. So I have to, you know, in this case, I do have to add <coughs> an actual comparison to say, okay, if I did get out of the loop early that I is still a valid index, then I'm going to have to check whether the element at that particular position of the array has the same value of k because I could have exited just because it is greater than k. Is that making any sense? All right. So how much is this going to buy me? I mean, assuming that we have an array, let's say, has uh, 20 items, OK? And the value that we are looking for is evenly distributed. So we are not always looking for small values. We are not always looking for large values. It's all over the place. So on the average, how much time am I saving just using this one optimization, assuming the array is already sorted? About one half, okay? Yeah, about one half is on the average, which is not bad, okay? Have I talked about the time complexity of the binary search yet? No, okay. Binary search is, is kind of interesting. I'm pretty sure I went through a little bit of that, okay? Did I talk about world population in this class? 
maybe not. Okay, so I did that in the evening class, but not in this class. World population right now, human population, is about seven billion or so. Okay, a little bit more than seven billion. So if I make a global directory of every person who is alive at this point, that array would have about seven point something you know, billion entries. Is that making any sense? And I'm going to sort this entire array by something. Okay? Maybe that's a way to look at DNA and actually come up with a number corresponding to the DNA of a person. So therefore, you know, I can sort you know, all those entries. Okay? So it doesn't matter what it is. You know, I have some way of sorting you know, um, an attribute of each person and you know, make that array sorted. Is that still make, making sense? Okay. So let's say somebody gives me you know, the DNA of someone. And the question is, is this person still alive? Is this you know, particular DNA pattern stored in the entire array of seven point something billion entries? So the question is, how many, let's say that person does not belong in the array. This is a deceased person, that person died already. So it's not in this array. How many comparisons do you think I need to perform to confirm that this entry is not in the array. Seven billion. Hmm? Seven billion. Seven billion. Okay. Any other takers? Remember, the array is already sorted, so we can use <coughs> optimizations like this one too. How do you sort that? Yikes. Well, it's if it uh, if I can convert it to just a number, I can sort it. And it's not difficult to sort DNA because it's just you know, the four letters, right? So if you have a string of, four, you know, each digit can only be one of four letters, if I can order each, you know, entry, then I can order the entire thing. Yep? I'm not sure if this is the right, on the right track, but if you can sort the DNA by, like, the oldest person's DNA first, and then... But then you're sorting by age instead of by DNA okay. pattern. Yep? I want to say, um, I want to say by the, just by the index itself. Mm, I'm not indexing. I still have to search. Yep. Well, you can look halfway through the array and see if yours is greater or less. Than. Right. Mm -hmm. So in that case, you know, how many comparisons would I need in order to confirm an entry is not in the array? Half of it. Half of it. Okay. So about three point something billion. Okay. You got the right idea, but it's a lot faster than you think. Yep. Go ahead. Fifty percent plus one. Hmm. Fifty percent plus one. Thirty percent. 50% plus one, so about three point something billion times. So one more. One more, okay. So we, it, it's roughly you know, three point something billion. 3.5, 3.6 billion. Again how you sort it? Hmm? How did you sort it? Okay, that's a good question. How do I sort it? Okay, let's take a, take a look at you know, DNA. And DNA. In DNA, you know, there are, you know, four different letters for each individual segment of a DNA. So you have A, C, G, T, you know, as one segment. So that means, you know, if, you know, how long is the human DNA? How many letters do we have? I cannot remember. No, 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 no. Each, each segment has four. But how many segments do we have, you know, for human DNA? Not really that many. It's not as many as we think, as you, know, you might have think, you, know, you might have thought. Uh, okay, so I can look for <coughs> I think it said uh, 240 uh, million. Okay, so 23 chromosomes, but in terms of the number of DNA. Oh, okay, so you, you saw something here? Yeah, get in. Sorry? Okay, so that's, but there are, but it's a finite number. Okay, you know the the key, the the point is, it is is a, is a finite number. So if each one can be, you know, A's, you know, G, A T C, I can't remember, you know, exactly how to. There's a way to spell it. You know, I think it's A T C G. Huh? Gattaca. Gattaca. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's right. Because it's very soft. That's how I remember. Yeah, G-A-T-C, Gattaca. Uh, good, good idea. <laughs> okay, so because if each one can only be G-A-T-C, you know, I can now number them, right? Because 
A can be considered less than C, C is less than G, and G is less than T. Okay, just by the alphabetical order. Okay, so if each one I can do an ordering like this, then I can you know, order the entire sequence. Is, is that making any sense? Okay, so I can order it. You know, I can just you know, order this you know, without any problems. Okay, so that kind of answers the question of how do I you know, order these particular entries, even though they're just you know, DNA entries. That's not even the main part of you know, today's lecture. The main part is you know, assuming there's a way to order everything, how many comparisons do I need to confirm an entry is not in the array? Now, because to confirm something is in the array, it's not too hard, okay? In fact, some people can say, but what if you have a lucky shot and the first one you compare is it? It doesn't even matter where I'm comparing. But to confirm something is not in the array is much harder. Are you, is there an implication, is there an implied part of it that you would know the number and you could just compare where yeah. it should have been? Mm, no, I, okay, here's the DNA of a person who is deceased. Right. And here's a table or an array of the DNAs of everyone who's alive. Right. I have a way to arrange Item, items right, in the array in the sort of order. So you should know about where it should have been. So just oh, I see what you mean. But let's say a we don't. Range. So yeah. You could just. But you don't know how you know it is distributed. That's the oh, problem, okay, right? I see. Right. It's just like you with sorting with last name. Right. Yeah, you kind of have, have an idea. You know, if I right. you know, if a last name is starting with let's say N, it's kind of in the middle. Right. But you don't know. You know, because the entire array can be skewed, right? You know, because we might have a lot more people with last names starting with R and S instead of, you know, the earlier, you know. Um, or Q or something. Exactly. Right. So that can skew the whole thing. So you don't know, you know, whether it is already skewed. So it's not a good idea to use that as an indicator of approximately where to look up. Okay. Okay. Yep. Go ahead. Okay, so I saw that you highlighted there was 220 million combinations. So if you're searching for a specific uh, combination of the four letters A, G, G, C, wouldn't it be not in the array of the 220 million? I think that 220 million is what? What is what is it measuring? It's the, the number of bases. Of no, it's the it's the bases. So it's, it's yeah, basically the, the length of the entire sequence, right? Yeah. Yeah. Which is not too bad. I mean, two hundred something million, and each one is only you know you ha only has four possibilities, which can be represented by two bits. It's not really that big of a deal by today's standard. I mean, in the past, yeah, two hundred something million is a is a big deal, but now it's like whatever. Okay, okay. But what if I tell you that with a population of eight billion or so, I can do that in thirty three comparisons. Okay, the, compar the comparison of <laughs> one entire DNA sequence with another DNA sequence is counted as one, okay? So even though individually it has you know, some smaller you know, comparisons, I'll just consider that as one single comparison. But even so, I still have eight billion entries to compare to, but I can say for sure that I can make a conclusion in 33 comparisons. <laughs> Expand. <laughs> Elaborate, right? Okay. The way it works, you know, because I can use binary search. Okay. Now, binary search is really cool because it is so simple that it is almost like freaky. Okay. It's so simple and so effective. It is, you know, almost freaky. So, okay. Let's not, you know, think about DNA sequence and stuff like that. Let's think about a whole big stack of um, cards, and each one has a number on it. Okay, and the stack of card is already sorted. Okay, is that okay so far? Just kind of imagine, you know, we have a big stack of card about this tall, and they're all have, they all have numbers, and they're all sorted. And here comes, you know, a number that I'm supposed to find within this big, huge, huge stack. Okay, I don't even know whether that number is in the huge stack or not. So instead of starting from the beginning or the end, like what you said, I will start from right in the middle. Okay. I don't even bother to look at the distribution of the numbers. I just start right in the middle. I pull one card out. I compare the values of the value on that card with the number that I'm supposed to find. Okay. Let's say the number I'm supposed to find is actually not in the stack. 
So what does that tell you? It has to be either greater than or less than the value that I, on the card that I'm holding. Does that make any sense? Okay. So I think it makes even more sense when I draw a picture. So this is my huge stack card here, stack of cards. I pick the one in the middle for comparison. If the value that I'm looking for is, let's say the, the card, the stack of cards is sorted in a non-decreasing fashion. So that means, you know, this card has to be less than or equal to the second card has to be, excuse me, uh, yeah, has to be less than or equal to. So this relationship, you know, applies to all the cards, you know, on the stack. Yep. Um, sorry, I don't mean to jump ahead. I do know where you're going with this. Go ahead. I know this is how computers look for things um, in a sorted fashion. Isn't that essentially how we look through a book too, on the page? Kind of, you know, but when you use a dictionary, you know, we actually, you know, do not quite use binary search, you know, because in dictionary, you know, we, we flip a lot, okay, we go, we flip. So we don't exactly use a binary search in, you know, searching for something in a dictionary or a phone book. You know, we, we use a combination, you know, because, of, you know, we just, we, we don't have the ability to quickly point out, you know, where is the middle of a, of a stack of pages. That's the reason why we flip. Yep. Is it a coincidence that 2 to the power of 33 is over 8 billion? That is exactly <laughs> why. Okay, but there's a reason why that you know, why it comes out that way. Okay, but that's a very good uh, observation. Okay, so if k is greater than the value on this particular card, <coughs> then k has to be greater than which half of the cards? The bottom half, right? So that means by one single comparison, I can eliminate one half of the entire stack of having the potential to contain the value k. <coughs> and then what do I do next? Half it again. Whatever is left, I do it exactly the same way. So for each comparison, I can eliminate one half of what is you know, remaining. Yep. So with um, like the names, as you said earlier, last names, like let's say you know, graduation at a college, so there's just tons and tons of students, you just for someone with the last name it's a, a V and so that's a really weird one you don't know whether it's going to be super near the end or whatever and it's like you just cut it in half and you end up with M so then you keep going and you just cut it up again. Yep. yep. It doesn't seem like it's very efficient but it is very efficient. Yep. It has to be a sorted array. It has to be a sorted array because if it's not sorted you cannot eliminate the you know, one half of the stack because you know the value K may still be there if it is not sorted. So you have to keep it sorted, okay? Now, this is why, you know, in 33 comparisons, I can eliminate, you know, all the possibilities and make a conclusion that, you know, the value that I'm searching for is not in the array of 8 point something billion. Okay, is that making any sense? Okay. Now, the way it works is if I have only one card, to confirm this is the one that I'm looking for or not requires one comparison. If I have three cards, it will require exactly two comparisons because the first comparison would pick the middle one and then I have you know either the top or the half one left so I need two comparisons. If I have I draw this I drew this in a particular way because you know it is you know seven cards. Um, is that right? One three seven no, sorry. I drew three cards and then I wrote two. Um, so one, three, seven. So with seven cards, I can use the middle one to break it into two halves. Each half only has three, but since I already know with three, I only need, I only need three comparisons. So with seven cards, oh, I think this one is counting the number of comparisons. It's actually correct. So two comparisons for three cards, <laughs> three comparisons for seven cards, four comparisons for how many cards? Sixteen. Or fifteen. Fifteen, exactly. Because 15 has 7 on one side, 7 on the other side, and 1 in the middle. So the 1 in the middle is the one that I use. I use one comparison to break it up into you know, 7. But I already know that 7 requires 3 comparisons. So it's just 1 plus 3, which is 4. Yep. You can, you can choose uh, which way to which way, because with an even number, like if you have four cards, you can pick this one or this one for comparison. It doesn't impact the um, actual outcome. Yeah. So 
So like with the second one where you have three lines, mm -hmm. if you do two comparisons but the number isn't in there, how do you know that the number isn't in there? Because with the first comparison, I pick this card and in the first, after the first comparison, I only have one card left because I only either have the top card or the bottom card left. Once I have one card left, I just need one more comparison to see whether that one single card is the one that I'm looking for. Okay? So in general, you know, how does this relate to that? In other words, the number of comparisons versus the number of cards. What is the relationship? Are you, you saying what's the equation? Yeah, yeah. What is the equation? How do I relate? Let's say, that let's call this, whoa, let's call this y bar, and let's call this n. Y bar n squared. You guys are getting the idea, okay? There's, there's an exponent involved somewhere, but it's not quite exactly the exponent. Go ahead. So a has to be less than or equal to, I want to say, to, to, to the power of n. Well, in this case, it's exact, okay? You know, I understand what you're saying with an equal to. Okay, basically, we're looking at 2 to the power of n minus 1 is bar a bar. Okay, when n is 1, 2 to the power of 1 is 1, excuse me, is 2. 2 minus 1 is 1, which is the number of items in the array. When n equals to 2, when we have two comparisons, 2 to the power of 2 is 4, 4 minus 1 is 3, and we have three items in the stack. Are we doing okay so far? Three comparisons. Two to the power of three is eight. Eight minus one is seven. So this time we have seven items you know, in our stack. That's how it goes. Okay? And that's why you know, 33 is a magic number in our case, because two to the power of 33 is eight point something billion, which is more than you know, seven billion, which is our population. Yep. What are the primes called that go in that kind of form? Say again? What are the primes? I think they're uh, they call primes. Them binary primes as well. 2 to the power of n minus 1. Mm, that's an interesting idea. I don't know whether they're always prime or not. They're, they're, not, they're, not. they're not. Yeah. They're not. But there was a theory of one time that they would be, and then they found they're not. But it works yeah, because 255 time. definitely is not prime. No. <laughs> <laughs> Yep. All right. Well, this is really nice because now I can say, you know, because if you just kind of keep this going, it doesn't take very long <coughs> for us to get to what if we have 33 comparisons, right? If the number of comparisons is 33, I'm not going to draw, you know, the stack of cards because 2 to the power of 33 minus 1 is a huge number. I'm going to have to use a lot of dry you know, markers mm -hmm. in order to draw, you know, to draw that many lines on the board, right? But this is really cool because that means what if world population doubles? <coughs> we colonize Mars and all the other planets, <laughs> all right? <You're> fine. <coughs> so world population can afford to double again, all right? So how many comparisons do I need when world population? Hmm? 34. 34. I need one more comparison when the population doubles. Okay, so binary search is really cool. Yep. It's about 8.5 billion. Yep, two to the power of 33. Yep. It's a huge number. Okay. Now there's a quick way to also figure out you know what is um, 8 billion. Okay, so if you look at 8 billion as a number, there's a really quick way to find out what is the closest power of two to this number. Okay. The way I do this is I break this up into 8 times 10 to the power of 3, or 8 times, um, and then that thing to the power of 3 here, because we have uh, 1,000, 1,000, 1,000, and this is 1,000, so it's 1,000 to the power of 3. The reason why I do this is because 10 to the power of 3 is approximately 2 to the power of 10, which is 10 to 24. So as an approximation, it's okay, it's good enough. So this number is approximately um, 2 to the power of 3, which is 8, times 2 to the power of 10, and then the whole thing to the power of 3. So if you count the number of power of 2s right here, then we have 30 on this side, we have 3 on this side, so it's 33. That's a really quick and easy way to guesstimate you know, the number of bits, because one bit is a binary digit, 
required to represent a particular number. Any questions? So one terabyte, if you get a one terabyte drive, to specify one byte within the one terabyte drive will require how many bits in an integer. One terabyte has is two is ten to the power of twelve, right? So we change this three to a four. We change this three to a four. So we require forty bits to lo to as a number to locate one byte out of one trillion bytes. And that's why thirty-two bit numbers are out the window because we no longer can specify one thing out of an entire drive because it's. It's not long enough. Okay, so this is good. Now we will you know, relate this to something that is actually important. So what I'll do is I'm going to use Office here, LibreOffice, and what I'll do is I'm going to play out a scenario of a company downsizing. It will be down to me and another software engineer. Okay. Did I mention this before? No? Okay, this is good. <clears throat> this is exactly what I'm doing to avoid people you know, having this kind of question. Because <laughs> I'm going to give you the reason why we talk about all this stuff. Okay, well, there was a hand a little bit earlier. No? no? Okay. All right, so here is you know, the company's... Okay, let me give you the background of this story first, and then we'll talk about the actual numbers, and you guys will go, okay, fine, you know, it's, it seems legitimate. Okay, so there's a software company where I worked, and it's down to me and another software engineer. Okay, the other software engineer is Pat. Okay, so it's down to Tac and Pat. And the boss says, okay, you know, I, I have heard a lot of stuff that you guys are much slinging and stuff like that. You know, I'm gonna you know, settle this once and for all and decide, you know, which one to let go using a programming competition. The problem is simple, okay? I'll give you an array that is sorted, and whoever comes up with the fastest algorithm in real time, I'm gonna use a stopwatch too, <coughs> will win the competition, okay? Is that okay so far? Now, the, the problem with this is, you know, my boss is not specifying the number of comparisons. He is comparing based on actual real time using a stopwatch. What is not so cool is because I'm the old, you know, the old timer in a company, and they never upgraded my computer. I'm still running a 386 SX computer at 16 megahertz, and many of you have not even heard of computers like that, right? <laughs> it's circa, if I try, I'm trying to remember what year, circa 1987 or so. Okay, you know, that's the time when the 386 SX computer first came out. It had the turbo button. <laughs> yeah, back yeah. then they still have a turbo button. <laughs> yep, yeah, I'm going turbo. I don't know why you'd want to go slower, though. Hmm? I never understood why you'd want it to go slower, though. Sometimes they interfere with video. <coughs> What's that? Sometimes they interfere with video modes. No, uh, so, well, they want to make it cheap. So the 386 SX computer only has a 16 bit data line instead of a 32 bit data line. Yeah. So to lay out the, the printed circuit board, it'll be easier because you only have 16 lines to go instead of 32 lines to go. You know, from one place to another place. And memory is cheaper, everything is cheaper. That's why they use the, six, the 386 SX computer. But because you need two cycles to grab something that's 32 bit, like an in instruction, so that effectively cut down the execution speed by half because you need two cycles to grab something compared to a 32 bit data bus. So that's why, that's also why we have a 16 megahertz clock, which is really, really slow. Okay, so I'm stuck with this really old computer. Pat was a new employee, and Pat has got a top-of-the-line i7 quad-core you know, computer that he got, that he or she got, you know, like a month ago, okay? So now I'm at a really bad disadvantage, right? Because if you think about it, just according to Moore's law, how much slower is my computer? We are talking about 1987 compared to 2013. Okay, so there are how many years in between? I'm really bad with math here. 26. 26 years, okay. So with 26 years, how many 18 month periods have gone by? 
18, every 18 months is like one year and a half, so you divide it by 1.5. Sixteen, right? At least sixteen, yeah. right? Close to seventeen. We'll just call it sixteen, okay? What does Moore law say about every eighteen months? Doubling. Double. Doubling, right? So we are talking about two to the power of sixteen. That's how much faster Pat's computer is compared to mine. Two to the power of sixteen is exactly six five five three six. So about sixty-five thousand times. <laughs> okay, so knowing that, okay, you know, Pat, you know, when Pat went through college, Pat actually paid attention on certain things, like Moore's Law. So Pat says, eh, my computer is so much faster than yours, I don't really need to think about this competition, I'm going to win anyway. Okay, so when the boss says, you know, the, comp the competition is based on real time, okay, you know, with, with a stopwatch, and you know, it's just you know, searching for something. <coughs> Pat decided, I'll just find the simplest algorithm to do searching, which is linear search, okay? Because if you look up linear search, the algorithm is really simple, okay? One loop, you know, really easy to figure out, everything is easy to do. So Pat decided, I'm, not, I'm going to use uh, linear search. Me, on the other hand, knowing my handicap, because my computer only has one over 65,000 time of the execution speed of Pat's computer, I decided, well, I'll give this a shot, but I need to use every advantage I can find. I am going to use binary search, which if you look at the algorithm, is a little bit more complicated, okay? More lines of code, and also more complicated, there are more variables to keep track of. Okay, so now we have, you know, so I, I would use one column for um, problem size, okay, problem size, which in this case is the size of the array. We'll use another column for tax computer, one column for Pat's computer, okay. And what I'll do also here is to say, you know, tax computer, if it takes me one, okay, I should do it in reverse, if it takes Pat's computer one <coughs> unit of time to do something, it will take my computer 2 to the power of 30, no, 16 times to do it, okay? So this is basically just saying, you know, it's just uh, um, normalizing the speed of the two computers. If it takes one clock or one nanosecond for Pat's computer to do it, it would take me, you know, 65,536 um, nanoseconds to do it. Is that okay so far? It's just according to Moore's law, okay? Okay. So now we have a problem size, okay? Um, when the problem size is one, in other, in other words, when there's exactly one entry in the entire array, you know, both computers only require one single comparison, okay? So with one comparison, <coughs> my computer is going to take, I'm just making sure that I can use the right thing here. My computer will take this much time to compute and Pat's computer, obviously, would just take that much time to complete. Is that making any sense? Okay. What if I bump up the, what if I tell my boss and say, boss, you know, I think, you know, having a, an array size of one is not exactly fair. How about we bump it up to three? Pat says, no problem. You know, you're just, I'm just going to distance you even more, right? So in this case, my computer will require two comparisons, which means I'm going to have two times this number as a unit of time. Pat's computer will require three comparisons, but you know what? You know, three times this oops, three times this number is not exactly a big deal. Okay. So if you look at the difference between the time here versus the time difference over here, Pat is saying, "Ha." Even worse, okay? So, do you want to keep going? And I say, yeah, we, I want to keep going. Okay, so the next number is going to be seven. Okay, with seven, my computer will take um, three comparisons. But remember, my computer is really slow, so three comparisons will take this much time to complete. And Pat's computer will require seven comparisons, but seven comparisons on Pat's computer will only require this much time. And once again, you know, he's 
Pat's computer is leading even more at this point. And then Pat comes back and tease me and say, want to go for another round? You know, want to make the problem size even bigger? Sure, let's go make it bigger. Okay, so, this, so I'm going to just you know, use the equation here up to this point. With 15, I will need four comparisons. Okay, so it's four times this number. And whereas, you know, Pat's computer will require, okay, I'm going to be a little bit lazy here, this number times this number here. But I'm going to put a dollar sign on the two, in front of the two, so that, you know, I can use some little trick later on. Okay, are we doing okay so far at this point? Okay. All right, so I can make this table pretty much, you know, bigger and bigger by a very simple way, okay? In terms of this column, the next number is always the previous number times 2 plus 1, right? 15 plus 15 is 30, 30 plus 1 is 31, which is 1 less than the next power of 2. Is that okay? With this number, it's really just, you know, this number plus this number because I just need to add one more comparison for each step. <coughs> is that making any sense? Yep, go ahead. Does that mean uh, for column 7a, shouldn't it be the previous number plus 1 times 2? So that you're increasing it to the next square? Actually, well, th six. okay, 32 is 2 to the power of 5 minus 1. Okay, you're right, yeah, sorry. Yeah, that's okay, no problem. And for Pat's column, it's really easy, you know, but what I had already, you know, will work, okay? Because it's really just the same number of the problem size, okay? So when you look at the difference, Pat is pulling away from me. I mean, I'm not gaining any ground at all. Or am I? I'm actually very slowly gaining something. It's not in number of microseconds or nanoseconds. What I'm gaining is in number of comparisons. Okay. Okay. Well, you know, we'll keep going like this. By the time we get to you know sixteen thousand, the boss says, "Well, I'm getting bored. You know, tech. I think you really should go find a you know cardboard box to box up all your items right about now." And I said, "No, no, no. You know, we can keep going a little bit. I mean, you know, this is kind of important to me." And so we keep going like that. Ooh. Ball says, wow, what happened? What happened on row 26? You know, from row 25 to row 26, you know. Tech. No, that's not even it. I mean, I took over between row 22 and row 23. What just happened? The amount that you're adding is smaller than the amount he's adding in time. Because every time when I just need to add 65,536, Pat needs to double, okay? So even though my computer is super duper slow compared to Pat's computer, eventually I'm still winning. What if I'm using an AT computer, IPM, your know, PC AT computer, which is even slower? It will just delay by a few rows, that's all. What if I'm using a mainframe computer back in the 50s? It'll push it down maybe a few more rows. But that's it, okay? You know, that was just be delaying the inevitable. Yep? I, uh, I'm sorry, I don't get how you passed them. You're, what's the equation for, for both of you? Ah, you're asking the right question, okay? Let's take a look at the equations, okay? I'm trying to. Okay, use the white, use the mouse pad for it. Okay, so what I'll do is I'm gonna say, okay, time taken by tax computer. If you want the exact equation, it's something like this, okay? It's like um, the log of bar a bar times some kind of constant of k. I'll make it k1, you know, because there'll be another k later on. Because of the because of the nature of the algorithm, it's always you know the number of comparisons is the log of the number of items in the array. Pat's computer, on the other hand, time taken by Pat's 
computer is bar E bar times K2 because you know, it, it's proportional to the number of items in the array. Are we doing okay so far? Now, in this case, you know, the difference or the ratio of K1 to K2 is pretty big because I'm using a really old computer. Okay, so if you look at K1 divided by K2, it is 65,536. What that's changing is really just how you scale the picture, but it doesn't change the shape of the curve. All right? So another way to visualize this is to plot it, right? It's pretty easy. Just select the whole thing. I'm not going to select the whole thing here because that's, that's going to be too lopsided. So I'll just I'll go ahead and select this portion. And I'm going to insert an object. And it's a chart. We'll go ahead and use a nice yeah, chart here. The finish. Nope. Oh, okay, that's. The red line is being hidden, so I need to change it a little bit. Okay, let's go change. Right. Let's go back to a column chart. Yep, that will do. Okay, well that's a pretty good representation right there. Um, the red line represents the amount of time Pat's computer need, needed to complete the task, and the um, blue line represents you know the one that I need to complete the task. Now remember, each, for each step, I'm doubling the size of the problem. So that's why you know, <coughs> it's going like this. If you double the size for each step, the log of that is really just linear. But if you look at the number of items you know, that you need to compare, it is the red line, which is exponential. So that's why you know, eventually I'm going to catch up. It's just a matter of time. In this particular case, I caught up, you know, right about here. So when we're dealing with 2 to the power of 21, you know, I caught up. Okay, is that okay so far? Yep. Really, um, I mean, in this example, obviously, you have a really slow computer versus a really fast one. So, but because I was kind of thinking maybe the linear would be better than binary in certain situations, but if you have two computers that are the same speed as binary, search just always better. Yep, pretty much. Now, binary search is does have a little bit more overhead. So when you have two computers of exactly the same speed, then you're still looking at you know K1 divided by K2 would still be greater than one because binary search has more stuff to keep track of. Um, but that number is going to be like maybe 1.5, 1.2, you know, thereabout, um, which means, you know, it doesn't take a large problem for uh, binary search to, you know, be a, to, to become the better algorithm. Yep. Okay, well, this is really kind of interesting because in this case, um, I, did I explain, you know, how those numbers come along or how I analyzed the algorithm? Just a little bit, okay, just kind of vaguely, but I didn't really go through a lot of math, but it makes sense, right? So the next question is, what do you have to do you know, in, when you're, you're caught in a situation like this? Should you, you know, bring out all the textbook of algorithms and look up everything and re-derive the, the time complexity of algorithms? No. The answer is quick and easy. You already know how to do it. You go to Wikipedia. <laughs> yeah, Wikipedia is always a good resource. And then you look up the search algorithms, okay? So you look up linear search. <coughs> and when you look up linear search, it will give you a time complexity somewhere. No. Okay, if it doesn't give me the time complexity, I'll have to modify this page. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, where's the big old notation? Where's the big old notation? Come on. Okay, there we go. Um, so right there, it has a big old notation here. 
Okay, I know it's really small and faint, and we'll look for it again, right there. Okay, so with binary, with linear search, it has a notation of big O of one. Then you'll say, but one is nice. I mean, one is a small number. You know, how come it is not as good as big O of log n? I mean, this is big O of log n, which is the time complexity of binary search. Well, the one and the log n is really the nature, you know, um, oh, okay, you know, that's actually not, not true. Big O of n, big O of one is specific to a particular case, but it's, the actual case is actually big O of n. Okay, there we go. So we're comparing big O of n to big O of log n. Okay, and n in this case is the size of a problem or the number of entries in the array. That really just goes back and correlate with what we are talking about here. Because in this case, you know, our bar A bar is actually the N. And big, the big O notation is really just saying, okay, so if I just say your big O of F of N, is basically saying, says, <coughs> an implementation of this algorithm takes F of N times some kind of K amount of time to finish. That's basically what it's saying. That's the, what the big O notation is for. Okay? So when we say, so that's why when you say big O of bar A bar, what is it saying? It's basically, okay, well, I'm going to copy and paste the quick portion of that here, except F of N becomes just bar A bar. What about big O of the log of bar A bar? Well, I'm going to do exactly the same thing here. Copy and paste, and change only the portion that I need to change, which is over here. Is this looking somewhat familiar at this point? That's what a big O notation says. I mean, it's just, you know, it's just saying that it is proportional to whatever is inside the parentheses of the big O notation. Now, depending on your computer, sometimes you have a large K, sometimes it has a smaller K. But if the, if the equation itself is different, if inside the parentheses one is bar A bar and the other one is log bar A bar, the log, the log bar A bar is still a better algorithm. Okay, it's just eventually you know, it will be faster than the other one. Are we doing okay so far in terms of these concepts? All right. <clears throat> well, since we're already talking about time complexity, we might as well go you know, one extra step and talk about NP-complete problems. Yep. Nice. Row sheet. Row sheet. Thank you. Okay, we'll talk about NP-complete problems because that might save your job one day too. Because let's just say that for this round of downsizing, you survive because you can show that your algorithm is beating Pat's algorithm and your boss was just mesmerized and go like, how did that happen? Well, I guess, you know, you want a competition and Pat, take this box and, you know, empty out the office. Okay, so you, 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 you kept your job and then at some point your boss is so impressed by your programming skills, your boss says, well, I have a new problem. You know, I need you to solve this problem. Okay, um, I'm having a, another startup company to deliver pizzas. Okay, and I need to write an algorithm to kind of optimize the trip so that you know the um, entire round trip time is minimized. Okay, I want to save you know gas. I want to save money. I want to save time. You know, so can you write me an algorithm to do something like that? And then you said. Sure, you know, I'll do it. I mean, you can, can I have a pay raise? Sure, okay, if you can finish this job, right? Okay, fine. So now we have you know, what we call a traveling salesman problem. The traveling salesman problem is actually quite simple, okay? You have, you know, a few destinations to go to, to traverse, and you have to determine in which order to traverse these you know, points will give you, you know, the least amount of cost, okay? In terms of time, in terms of fuel, you know, whatever cost you is associated with the traveling. Am I doing okay so far? Okay. Um, so how would you solve that problem? 
Well, there's no easy solution to this one, okay? So with three, with four destinations, so let's say we have four places to go to, so we have A, B, C, D, but you are originating from, let's say, point A, so point A is not something that you actually can choose, but between B, C, and D, you can always choose an order to traverse B, C, and D. How many ways can I choose you know, between B, C, and D? Assuming A is just the point of origin, so you cannot change it. Okay, well, starting with B, you have another way to do this. You can do a B, D, C. You can choose to go to point C first, then you can go to point B next, point D last. Flip those two. You can choose to go to point D first, then you can go to point C and then point B. And you can also go to point B and then point C. Okay, these are the six possible ways to traverse you know, these particular points. The last point is going back to the pizza store, which is also A, but since you do not have any control over these two points, we'll just focus on the three places in between. Am I making any sense so far? So there are six possible ways to go to the three um, delivery points in this case. And all you have to do is really to figure out what is the cost going in this particular route. Okay, it's X amount. This one, Y amount, and so on. And once you have the cost of each route, then you just say, easy, pick the, easy, pick the shortest one or the one that has the least cost, and that's your optimal answer. Is that making any sense? How many stops do you think a pizza, car, truck, whatever, usually has to stop? It cannot be that many because if it's too many, the pizzas will start to be cool down and then, you know, it's not good. Probably two or three. Four. Hmm? Four or five, okay? Let's say it's five, okay? Let's say you have to go for five stops. How many different ways do we have, you know, to traverse five points, five, uh, five stops? Twenty-five. No. <laughs> okay, to traverse five points, which means, you know, the first and the last, you know, do not count for those five points because you know you have to start with the pizza stop stop and then end with the pizza stop, right? You have five destinations to choose as a first choice. Right? But once you pick the first one, you only have four left to choose as your second point. Once you have chosen two, then you only have three left to choose as your third and then fourth the last one, you only have one choice because you have chosen four already, so you only have one left. So there are 120, if I remember right. Yep, my, my math is okay this time. So there are 120 possible ways to you know, traverse five points, and most computers wouldn't take that much time to figure out you know, the cost of you know, 120 alternative routes to you know, five different points, right? So you wrote your algorithm, you know, gave it to your boss, it works fine, you know, n you know, no problem, okay? And your boss ends up you know, saving a lot of money because you know, you know, choosing a good route you know, can save you know, a lot of fuel and time, you know, so your boss is really happy about this. You got your pay raise, okay? And then one day your boss you know, came back to you and threatened to fire you and rehire Pat. Because your boss said your program doesn't work, <coughs> and you're, you're you're completely baffled. It's like, but boss, it has been working for the past year. What do you mean by it doesn't work? Your boss says, well, you know, I have a buddy who works for UPS, and the, my buddy says, you know, he could use a program like that to plan the routes of UPS you know, de delivery trucks, okay, for packages and, and whatnot. And then I ran your program, but it. It never comes back with an answer. It just keeps running. It just hung, it hung up on me. They go like, hmm, that's interesting. And, you, and then you ask your boss, and you ask, how many stops you know, do you have to, you know, does a UPS truck or delivery truck has to you know, consider on a daily basis? What do you think? A lot. A little over 100 or 300. 300? A single guy or all yeah. trucks? No, a single truck. I don't know. Yeah, I have no idea. Let's say it's 40, okay? You know, which I think is a fairly small number, right? You have a fairly small little you know, UPS truck that only has 40 stops, okay? Which doesn't seem to be too bad. I mean, we can handle five you know, without any problems. But when you have 40 stops, you're looking at the total number of routes you have to consider is 40 times 39 times 38 
times 37, and so on, all the way down to 1. In other words, it is 40 factorial. Okay? And 40 factorial doesn't sound too bad compared to 5 factorial. I mean, I mean we, we have dealt with exponential stuff already, right? I mean, this, is, this doesn't seem too bad. Well, but it is kind of bad. Yep. Did you tell your boss you're going to sue for using your program? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, once you work for a company, you know, it doesn't belong to you anymore. <laughs> okay, so we are looking at 40 factorial, which is uh, using an exclamation point, which is right here. And then we we'll press the enter key. I mean, it's only 8.159. What is the big deal of 8? No, wait, hold on a second here. Times 10 to the power of 47. <laughs> okay, so no wonder your program seems to have hung up even because it has that many different alternatives to consider. Am I making any sense here? So now your boss is threatening to fire you because your program is just not very smart. Okay, I'm gonna hire Pat back, you know, because you know, you know, I think you beat him unfairly last time anyway. You chose a smart algorithm. Okay, how unfair of you. <laughs> okay, your boss says I'm gonna hire Pat back. You should quit. Hmm? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Your boss is a jerk. <laughs> so but let's say you wanna stay there because you know you have free pizza, right? Um, <laughs> really good pizza. Yeah, I can optimize this algorithm a little more because I can eliminate one stop because I just ate that one pizza. <laughs> 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 so, so let's say you want to keep that job, okay? But you, what you can do, what can you possibly do in this case? I mean, you're running up against the wall because you know, that's the number of possibilities to consider. Now, you can do other types of optimization, like you know, you can divide the, uh, the, your de delivery route into different zones, and then only do optimization within the zone. Then you have smaller subproblems. But if you really want to do a global, quote unquote, global optimization, which means it has to be the absolute best path, then this is a problem that you cannot avoid. Okay. So the question now is, how can you show that mm, you can hire Pat back? You can hire the most you know, uh, uh, intelligent programmer there is today, but it's not going to help. Okay? So what you're going to do is you will say, but boss, this is what we call an NP-complete problem. Now, there's a one interesting about NP-complete problems. Okay? There are multiple. There's a whole collection of problems that are called NP-complete because they can be transformed from one to the other one with a relatively small amount of, amount of time. But up to now, nobody can solve those problems effectively. So your ch the chances of your boss being able to hire someone to solve those problems effectively is next to none, basically. Okay. So now your boss says, but what is MP complete? I mean, tell me what is MP complete? Why is it important? Okay. Well, you can always look it up and you know point your boss to the Wikipedia entry. But what we, what really is going on here? What is NP and you know let's not talk about complete, but what is NP itself? NP. So I'm going to write it on my little mouse pad here. NP means non-deterministic. NP means polynomial. Polynomial. Okay non-deterministic polynomial time. Doesn't that kind of remind you of the cartoon that we just looked at a little bit earlier? Let me bring that up again, because I'm pretty sure some of you remember that picture. Okay, non-deterministic and polynomial time is down. The P usually means polynomial time right there, right underneath. Okay, non-deterministic and polynomial time. So what does that mean exactly? Well, the easiest way to put it is like this. Non-deterministic means um, in a computer with an infinite number of cores. That's one way to look at it. Okay. Non-deterministic means 
whenever you feel like it, you can say, hey, I need a new core. Okay, so suddenly your i7 processor becomes an infinite core computer. Whenever you, you say, okay, I, can, I think I can do this in parallel to everything else, pops, a new core appears. Yep. Can the computer believe it has an infinite number of cores? Like they have computers that are four core and it splits those four into 16. They cannot really, okay, so realistically speaking, you cannot, okay? Realistically speaking, an i7 quad core processor really only has four physical core. Even with hyper-threading, it has the pretense of eight different cores. But that's the limit of the hardware. If you have more than eight processes you know, that need to, that can execute at the same time, they will have to time share, okay? You know, each process will you know, run for a little bit of time, and then the OS, will, the operating system will kick in and say, okay, you got your you know, two milliseconds of execution, execution time, it's time for the next one to use the processor, okay? So in practice, we do not have such a thing called infinite number of cores, but that's basically what it says here, is in theory, if you can have a computer that can basically magically create a new core on the fly anytime it wants to, and incur no additional cost to accessing memory or cache and stuff like that. Um, that's basically what non-deterministic means you know, in our you know, basic our terms today. Polynomial time, okay, in this case, polynomial time means a big O of some kind of polynomial. So it's basically n to the power of con a constant k. Okay? Um, so in this case, it's just a polynomial. It, the k has to be constant. Okay? k cannot change. So it can be cubed, can be squared, can be to the fourth of something like that. But it is n to the power of something, n being the size of the problem. In this case, the number of stops you know, in your planning uh, uh, problem. Okay, so NP complete means, you know, in order to solve the problem, it will take a magical computer that has an infinite number of cores, polyno a time that is, pol that is proportional to a power of the problem size to solve the problem. <coughs> That's NP. Okay, so in this case, you know, in, in route planning, you can quite easily see how it is you know, big O of n to the power of something. Because if n is the problem size, then it becomes just big O of n because each processor can evaluate a particular path. And as a result, then it becomes just you know, basically uh, proportional to the number of stops on the route to determine which one is the fastest. Are we making sense so far? But if you take that class called uh, computational theory or the analysis, analysis, of comp uh, analysis of algorithms, then you can now argue with your boss and say, well, once a problem is you know, proved, proven to be NP complete, that means no one up to this point from the birth of computer science can solve those problems effectively using a limited core or limited thread computer. The chances of you hiring the next person and being able to solve this problem is zilch. <laughs> okay, so maybe your boss will be convinced to keep you as an employee because you know, you know, it's a it's such a hard problem. There's no way to solve it effectively. Okay, so that is why in this picture here, this person. That will answer the question. I just wanted to learn how to program video games. Yes, but do you want to keep your job? <laughs> that really is the question, right? I mean, sure, we all have things that we want to do, you know, but the question is, do you want to do it at least well enough that you will, be, you will stay competitive? If so, you know, then this stuff is actually important. Okay, are we doing okay so far with you know, the concepts that we just talked about in today's class? Okay, now I'm not getting into any of the details, okay? You know, no details whatsoever. Just kind of an overview of this stuff here. Many of you will never see this ever again until you get to the third year in a four-year university in a computer science program, okay? But when you do see it again, you know, I hope you still remember why you need to study that stuff because most professors won't tell you why it is important. They would just give you 
big, thick book, which also doesn't explain why that stuff is important. <laughs> It'll just give you a whole bunch of <laughs> equations, a whole bunch of proofs and stuff like that, and say, prove the time complexity of bubble sort versus you know, quick sort. Okay? Well, which by itself is also interesting, but you know, knowing why this stuff is important, I think is, more Im is important by itself. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm, I think I'll go, go ahead and let you guys go a bit, about five minutes early today. Um, and then next time, we'll actually talk about the binary search algorithm. Well, I want to learn how to program.